just wait. Okay, recording is activated. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cloud Lunch and Learn sessions. My name is Hugo Barona, and today we have the third session of our series of sessions related to blockchain. We have Juarez with us explaining how to use Hyperledger on Azure blockchain. I hand over to you, Juarez. Thanks a lot, Hugo. Uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Juarez Jr., and I work for Microsoft in Ireland. Uh, here you can see my contact details, you know, my email address, my handles on Twitter and Medium, as well as my LinkedIn profile. So uh, in case there's something uh, interesting or uh, any uh, information that you want to explore more during my session here today, feel free to reach out to me, okay? Today, uh, we are here to talk about a blockchain uh, and Hyperledger blockchain on Azure. Uh, what we can call somehow the de facto protocol and platform for enterprise B2B applications when we consider blockchain as a technology. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's um, start the session here. Let's talk about Hyperledger as a protocol and framework. Um, okay, so Hyperledger, uh, there are two things here. The first one is that Hyperledger is a foundation, an open source foundation. Uh, and, and Hyperledger as an, as an org, for example, it hosts many different projects, okay? The, the, the most famous one is actually Hyperledger Fabric uh, because it's, I would say, a uh, blockchain protocol and um, enterprise framework that's being used, I would say, extensively by many companies and also solutions that are enterprise related. Uh, but we do have many other projects like Indy, Iroha, Sawtooth, and so on. Uh, but speaking of Hyperledger Fabric, then uh, it's a permissioned blockchain, okay? So it's aimed at enterprise solutions, B2B. Uh, and when I say permissioned, remember, I'm saying that it's not actually a public blockchain, okay? So in order to join what we call a consortium, the uh, network founder uh, or the network owner, maybe, uh, should invite the participant orgs to join, and they have to be allowed to join such blockchain network. Uh, and normally, uh, the security and the authorization, authentication, auditing, everything uh, is controlled by security certificates, uh, key stores, and con specific configurations. Okay, so remember that Hyperledger Fabric is permissioned. Uh, it's an open source protocol, uh, of course, for distributed ledger uh, solutions. Um, it provides uh, the permissioned model, as I explained, and it uses what, a component called MSP, the Membership Services Provider. And this MSP actually implements a kind of CA certificate authority that will then uh, consolidate and concentrate all the crypto materials and all the security components that are required as I explained. Okay, so security certificates, also um, the key stores, uh, control also not only data uh, at rest, you know, storage, but also data in motion, security for the secure communication channels and so on. Hyperledger is modular. Uh, this is really nice. It follows the um, PAN approach, you know, uh, pluggable authentication modules or pluggable modules um, when you are not talking about security. So all the components, uh, you know, including the consensus algorithm, the MSP, the endorser node, uh, the chain code node, all the, the peer nodes, they actually um, have some, I would say, integration points or extension points that you can use in, in in case you want, for example, to replace the existing consensus algorithm with your own, you know? Uh, and this is really good because uh, it gives uh, the uh, blockchain developers, I would say, the leeway to replace the implementation and really integrate with any disparate component. Let's say, for example, that you want to use a mainframe server to perform authentication. Okay, that's possible. Uh, it also enables the, a, a pluggable data store, so pluggability not only for consensus protocols, but many different components. It's programmable, uh, so it means that you can actually implement uh, smart contracts as with the other uh, blockchain protocols. Uh, 
And the good thing is that uh, Hyperledger Fabric, uh, you can leverage your existing skills in terms of programming languages. So let's say that you have a team and you have many Java developers, for example, you can implement both the client side as well as the server side, the, the smart contract, the backend side uh, in Java. Um, e, in Hyperledger, it also has a very elaborate mechanisms to allow clear separation of channels and also uh, the participants and the transactions. Uh, there are some, uh, I would say, uh, scenarios, for example, where you want to control a given asset, but you don't want, for example, to disclose all the information about that given asset. And Hyperledger has mechanisms like uh, what we call identity mixer for zero knowledge proof and Zcat zero knowledge asset transfer, where uh, there are ways that you can authenticate first without disclosing your full information in terms of users profile and, and 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 so on but also transfer the assets uh without disclosing all the information about it uh so uh you can use what we call private data collections uh, to separate some data sets inside a given channel for example uh so hyperledger uh that's one of the main reasons why it's considered uh, i would say the de facto and, and a full-fledged enterprise blockchain network Interesting to say, no crypto is required, so you don't have to pay for your transactions. You don't have to own uh, BTC, Bitcoin, or uh, Ether, ETH, for example, uh, as with the other uh, protocols. Okay. Uh, at last but not least, uh, Hyperledger is hosted by the Linux Foundation, so it follows the very same governance model. As I explained, there are other projects that are part of Hyperledger as a foundation and different projects and with different concerns. Uh, just to give you a glimpse here, so beyond Fabric, uh, which is a permissioned uh, protocol with channel support, and, and the channels, they are ways that you can, as I explained, uh, separate from a security point of view all the participants. But we also have ED for uh, decentralized identity or SSI, what they call self-sovereign identity where uh, when you authenticate, for example, you can selectively uh, dictate uh, which, uh, I would say, uh, fields um, that belong to your profile or the information you would like to, to share, for example. We have Sawtooth, uh, which follows uh, an Ethereum virtual machine transaction uh, approach to the transactions and the transaction family and many other projects here, okay? So make sure that you visit hyperledger.org uh, so you can, I would say, have a look at the different projects there and of course, Hyperledger Fabric. Let's move to talk about a little bit about the architecture and Hyperledger Fabric. So uh, it's a DLT uh, service, of course. Uh, the identity part, the first block here, you can see we have the membership services, MSP. So things related to enrollment in a given network, or transaction, uh, the control of identities, uh, all the things related to the triple way in security, you know, authentication, authorization, and auditing, for example. This is the main uh, component concerning this uh, block diagram. Uh, then we have the security and crypto services uh, and this big block here at the center called consensus services. Uh, so this is exactly where you should expect the main blockchain uh, related components. Uh, for example, the distributed ledger. Uh, so remember, the ledger is a kind of data store, a shared one, a distributed one, uh, but it is immutable. Hyperledger Fabric has a different component cor called the ordering service uh, and the ordering node. Let's put it that way. And this node is actually uh, responsible for ordering the transactions, you know. So uh, you can, for example, make sure that the transactions, they are they follow the asset approach, they are atomic, consistent, indefinite, and, 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 and durable ones. Uh, and the ordering node will uh, then uh, control uh, the order of given, of given um, blockchain network and all the transactions that happen uh, during the time T, T1, T2, and so on, okay? Endorsement uh, validation is a kind of in-memory simulation of your transaction because uh, the endorsement actually it works uh, as per your consensus algorithm. So the consensus is actually a situation where you have uh, data input, okay, or valid data sent to your smart contract, and then all the nodes and all the um, 
different uh, uh, participant peers, they will run that data against your smart contract and the business logic there to make sure that the data is valid first and second, that the transaction is properly fulfilled with no errors or no exceptions. And after that, an endorsement is guaranteed and, and then you sent uh, this first uh, response to your client, uh, the one that uh, is proposing a transaction to confirm that uh, this transaction can be validated by the several different nodes. So several different nodes validating our transactions, that's where we have what we call the consensus then, okay? The network protocol is actually the underlying protocol. Uh, I think we can abstract it here, but if you are curious, and now if you know Hyperledger specifically, it uses uh, Docker, uh, container technology, also uh, depending on the scenario, can use Kubernetes or Golang. So the protocol here is uh, gRPC. Uh, and on top of that, we have then the ledger and the transactions. Okay, and you can use the APIs, the SDKs, uh, in some cases a REST API as well to perform your transactions. And the last component, you know, is this smart contract, of course. So we have Hyperledger, uh, the latest versions, they have a specific node to run uh, and host and run the, the smart contracts. Uh, that was a change that happened uh, during the transition from 1.0 to 1.1, as far as I remember, in order to reach better scalability. Uh, but remember that uh, the chain code services, uh, at the end of the day, you host your chain code inside a Docker container, and, and then you can use a secure container, a security, a secure registry, and so on, okay? Let's move here, uh, more in practical terms. Let's see all those components and the most important ones that will allow you to understand how the transaction works. So let's say that I want to create a blockchain network as ex explained in the previous sessions. Uh, and by the way, if you missed the previous sessions, you can visit uh, Cloud Lunch and Learn's um, channel on YouTube uh, and the sessions about blockchain are there. For you. Uh, let's say we have three organizations here, okay? The one at the top is what we can call the founder organization, okay? Let's say that I'm, um, I don't know, Coca-Cola and I want to start a blockchain network because I want to control all the transactions between my providers, my partners, the distributors, uh, the companies that I buy the, the, the machines from, for example, the, the, the industrial controllers and things like that. And then we have a couple of organizations here. We can call that a blockchain consortium then, okay? So this network founder is the one that starts the network, uh, decides about uh, its topo initial topology, and then uh, moves to invite other organizations to join this blockchain network, a permissioned one, remember? You know, so this founder org has to provide the configuration file, the security certificates and everything to all the other organizations that are interested in joining this consortium, this blockchain network. Uh, we have Hyperledger Fabric here to perform the orchestration of those uh, Docker containers uh, because for a simple network like this one, for example, you can end up having more than 20 Docker containers. So it's important for you to have an orchestrator and AKS is just the right service uh, to support that. Okay, uh, at the top, I talked a little bit about it. The ordering service is actually the uh, node uh, uh, which will be responsible for ordering the transactions and, and the blocks and everything, okay? Uh, so the, it's well, you can see it as a kind of transaction manager. Uh, and the peer nodes, they, they host the smart contracts and they host a copy of those ledgers. So, and they are also responsible for the endorsement phase. Okay, so we have uh, along with that, you can see crypto materials here. So the, so the certificates, they are also available to all the participants. So they can uh, authenticate and transact uh, because this is a permissioned network, remember. Uh, this is just to give you a glimpse of what a, a, a block would, lo would uh, look like uh, in Hyperledger. Okay, so there are many different informations here about, for example, the previous hash, you know, because we have a chain of blocks, we have inf information about the chain code, information about the endorsers, for example, and, and the nodes in Hyperledger, they can endorse the transaction as I explained, but they also act as committers. Those are the nodes that actually uh, perform uh, past the in-memory simulation during the endorsement phase. 
they persist the information, so they commit the information to the underlying persistent stores. Uh, but let's explain uh, better here uh, all the components in action now, so you can really understand what I'm talking about, okay? Because there are so many moving parts here and so many different components. The first thing, remember, uh, we have uh, in Hyperledger and blockchain solutions, uh, what we can consider as the two main components here, the client application, okay? And that can be, as I explained, uh, an iOS application or uh, uh, an Android application, a web application, okay? Or an existing application, for example, in PHP or Perl that you can modify and perhaps use uh, a specific client to, to, to send the transactions to your blockchain, um, smart contact in the network. Uh, and then we have the blockchain network here with the membership service. Remember the CA, uh, Certificate Authority. So all the federation in terms of identity, membership, and those things, they are controlled by this node. The peer nodes, they uh, can act as endorsers or committers, or they can be both, or they can be just endorsers or just committers. This is actually dictated but by what we call in Hyperledger uh, endorsement policy. So let's say that you have 20 nodes, for example, you can select five nodes and say that you want those nodes to act as committers, for example, only, okay? Uh, we have this smart contract with the chain code, okay? This is the smart contract container. So this is where your smart contract in Golang or Java or Node.js will be hosted. Uh, and we have the ordering node, as I explained. Uh, this is the one that will, uh, I would say, control all the, um, uh, orchestration and the coordination related to your transactions, the blocks and everything else. Uh, so the flow starts uh, like that. Let's see how the blockchain transaction works in Hyperledger. You send uh, an enroll enrollment request, okay, to the uh, MSP and you receive uh, the validation concerning the certificate. So we can somehow consider that as the authentication and authorization phase, okay. So you move to request an endorsement for a given transaction. So this is the client, let's say you are a mobile client, you have a form and you are sending information to perform a blockchain transaction behind the scenes. Uh, interesting to say, uh, traditional transactions, you know, normally, uh, let's say that you have a scenario with uh, distributed uh, transactions, X8 transactions or two-phase commit. Normally one transaction from the client side translates to one transaction on the um, backend or server side. With blockchain, that's different because for each um, uh, a node or a peer node that you have, uh, okay, let's say that you submit one business transaction, but you have 20 peer nodes, you can end up having uh, one blockchain or one traditional classic plain business transaction on the client side, but on the blockchain side, you are actually executing 20 transactions in order to achieve the finality of one business transaction from the client, okay? Because the number of nodes, remember all the nodes, we, we, we have to achieve consensus here. So all the nodes, they have to execute, endorse the transaction and then commit and execute the transaction. It can vary a little bit depending on the endorsement policy, but that's it. So you request the endorsement for this transaction. So you are sending data from the client to your blockchain network. The peers, they will receive the, the transaction and then uh, try to endorse it simulate this transaction in memory. So remember, this is simulation. We are not modifying the underlying uh, persistent stores yet, the ledger in what we call the world state. So you send this data input to your smart contract. It is executed against your smart contract. In case the smart contract is fulfilled, you receive a response and you send that a response back to your client. This is what we call the signed uh, read-write set, okay? So it has all the simulation about the transaction, all the information about the blocks, all the information about the certificates, uh, the data input, everything is validated, okay? Uh, given that uh, this is uh, past the endorsement phase, then you can submit the same transaction to your ordering service, okay? So there's a second call, it goes to your ordering service, and then this is the service that will uh, batch the transactions and the blocks and then deliver uh, this batch to your committer node. And this committer node now, after the initial in-memory validation, will move to write uh, the information to your ledger in the world state and effectively uh, persist the transaction. 
One last step here, uh, the, the client can uh, subscribe to receive a kind of callback notification. So in, let's say that after the blockchain transaction is confirmed on the blockchain side, you want to, I don't know, move, move a file and use FTP or send an email message or show a pop-up message, you know, whatever. So you can actually uh, receive this as a kind of uh, acknowledgement and callback uh, call. Okay, so this is the basic structure. Just to mention, uh, in case you are using managed blockchain, like the Azure blockchain service, for example, your focus will be on writing the client application with your technology of choice, you know, Java, Golang, or um, JavaScript, Node.js, and the smart contract. In Hyperledger Fabric, uh, for the smart contract, you can use currently Java, Golang and JavaScript, but there's no way to use Python, okay? Because for the client side, there's an existing Python SDK that you can use to create uh, blockchain applications on the client side that can submit uh, transactions to our Hyperledger Fabric uh, network. Let's talk a little bit about Hyperledger on Azure. Uh, so uh, Microsoft joined the Hyperledger uh, Foundation last year, okay? Uh, back in June uh, 18, 2019. Uh, you have the link here, you can have a look later. Uh, and this is the official announcement. Uh, and the best solution that we have currently concerning Hyperledger Fabric on Azure is to use our marketplace template to uh, deploy and configure a blockchain network, a Hyperledger network on top of Kubernetes. Uh, by the way, I have a blog post with all these steps uh, that you can follow later, okay? Because it takes time. There is, uh, remember, there are so many components here, things like uh, the Kubernetes cluster, Docker containers, storage, and so on, VMs, and so on, right? But anyway, it's not so uh, complicated. Uh, I can show the, the blog post quickly later. And let's talk a little bit about the distributed app development uh, for Hyperledger Fabric, okay, the apps. Uh, the options here as languages for uh, both the client and server or smart contact side, let's, let's say smart contact side, you can use Java, Golang, and JavaScript, okay? For the client side, you can also use Python. Visual Studio Code is the tool that you can use, and there are plenty of extensions that you can use to support the development uh, of Hyperledger smart contracts, uh, what we call Chain Code. Okay, Chain Code is the name, official name for Hyperledger smart contracts. Node.js is a dependency as well. Um, uh, so, okay, let me now show you different things here, uh, just to complement. Um, is on here. Um, first, this is the blog post that I talked about. Okay, so you can follow um, all the steps here uh, concerning how to deploy your uh, Hyperledger network with Kubernetes. Uh, and you have, remember that we have two different nodes here. We have what we call the peer nodes, the ones that host the smart contract responsible for the endorsement in, in the commit phases. And we have the ordering node, uh, the one that is actually responsible for managing the transactions uh, somehow. Uh, and you, with these steps here, you can deploy both, okay? So you can start your consortium. Just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, uh, I have created this resource group here where I deployed um, two, different um, uh, okay two different nodes here okay the uh, member node okay you will see that the protocol here is hyperledger fabric and this is an ordering node it's an orderer okay uh, but but the other one is uh, actually one a peer node okay the protocol is still hyperledger fabric but it's a peer node okay so um, from that uh, diagram that I showed, you can see what I'm talking about here again. Um, remember, okay, we have the ordering node and the peer nodes here. Okay, this one is responsible for ordering the transactions and these ones, they host the ledger, the smart contract, and they also have the crypto certificates. Um, 
Okay, in order to connect, you have to export the information from your given node. So you have to basically create uh, what we call a wallet. Okay, there are two things. Then you need to export the credentials here and the connection profile. Okay, these are JSON files. Uh, the connection profile will provide the information about the remote host uh, on Azure IP ports and certificates and, and so on. And the other mean that will provide uh, the, the certificates, you know, uh, that you can use to authenticate. Um, all right, uh, let me show you now one simple uh, smart contract in Golang. OK, this is a uh, plain Golang, so package main here with all the imports, you know, the specific ones related to Hyperledger. Uh, and, and, and the the chain code interface, actually, there are some methods that you have to implement. The first one is the init method. OK, um, and the init method, you can use it to initiate your internal uh, variables and data, you know, in case you want. Uh, and here we implemented the invoke method and the invoke method you can then uh, delegate to a given business method. OK, for this sample here we have the invoke uh, method. OK, one for example that can uh, we have uh, the simulation of a couple of accounts here A and B. So you can transfer funds from one account to another. There's also a kind of logical delete here because remember this is just uh, I would say alter the state of a given uh, data set because there's no removal in blockchain. OK, remember the mutability feature and also query. Uh, one more implementation of invoke here. Uh, the delete as I explained and one more uh, elaborate version of query here. But this is the basic smart contract, so you can see that this is a basic Golang. Uh, and you can implement these smart contracts uh, and you, uh, with Java and, and JavaScript as well. OK, but no smart contracts for Python. So I can show you one transaction here. Where is it? Oh, yes, here. Let me connect. OK. Uh, all right, so uh, first thing, for example, let me query. So um, no, I have to actually set some environment variables here first. Uh, so you can see here basically what I need to inform the uh, organization name. OK, in this case, I want to run the transactions against the peer, the user identity for authentication, the smart contract name, the smart contract version. OK, because you can deploy different versions of smart contracts. Let's say that you started a blockchain network with your partners today. Uh, and in two weeks from now, you will have uh, 20 partners using one version of a given smart contract. But then you decided to, uh, I would say, increment and implement more business methods. You can deploy version two of that smart contract without disrupting the existing ones. So you give them the time to actually migrate to your latest versions. The language is Golang. This is the path for my smart contract file, the same one that I presented on um, VS Code. And uh, the channel name, you know, the channels, they are important because they are uh, the components that connect all those peers. So you, when you create one channel, for example, uh, the transactions uh, on that channel, they will be seen by all the participant nodes in that channel only. So this is how Hyperledger implements uh, the separation in terms of security. OK, and the channel when you start it, it starts from the Genesis block, block zero as well. So that's one of the main reasons why you achieve more scalability with Hyperledger. OK, um, let me just configure this. OK. OK, so this is just to make sure that I'm targeting the right container. OK, uh, let me look. OK, let's query the value of uh, A, for example. This is smart contract is already deployed. OK, so let's see uh, the value of account A here. OK, it's 80. Uh, let's check then account B. Um, yes. Perfect. So I can transfer 10 from account A to B, for example, here. Um, OK, 
Um, and what happened behind the scenes here? So remember, when I submitted this data, OK, 10, and I wanted to transfer from uh, A to B, remember that one endorsement phase happened, OK, as I explained. So all the steps behind the scenes here, they happened, OK? So, for example, I enrolled, I authenticated, I submitted uh, 10 as an, uh, an, a data input for this transaction. I requested the endorsement phase. I received the confirmation on the signed read write set. OK, then I sent this transaction to the ordering service. It sent to the committer nodes. The committer nodes uh, effectively committed the transactions and then returned a notification. So behind the scenes, when I transferred uh, 10 from account A to B, that's what happened here. And we can confirm now. We can check the values for account uh, A again. You will see now um, 70 and account uh, B again. You will see 230. Yes, that's it. Um, so beyond that, I would like to show you uh, here the, the blog post, as I explained, all the steps are here. So you can use to deploy your nodes, the, the ordering node and, and the peer nodes, as many as you want. OK, all the steps uh, and the explanations, they are here. Uh, I also have this. The first the first thing the Python SDK is here as well, for example, but you can see that it is work in progress. OK, and this is to allow you to create clients that can interact with the Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. OK. Uh, but this is not for smart contracts, uh, and you can see here. Uh, at the moment, it works uh, with Hyperledger 1.4 only because Hyperledger doesn't. The latest version is version 2.0. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's talk about Java here. The same thing with Java. There's a, a gateway SDK for Java. This is to code the the client applications. Okay, and you can see, here, for example, that. Uh, you need to use a connection uh, JSON, for example. This is the JSON that I told you you can extract from uh, the the console here. OK, so uh, sorry, you can. This is the connection profile, the JSON file that you can get from here. OK, uh, you are actually instantiating a wallet, so you need to provide the information about the user for authentication, uh, the target channel and the target smart contract, you know, as uh, I provided in those uh, environment variables, and that's it. You can transact. So this is, I would say, a simple example of uh, a minimal Java client that you can use. Uh, and all the Java docs, you know, the documentation uh, is really good, so you can check all the, the, the classes here as usual for Java developers. There's also a Hyperledger Fabric for uh, SDK for Node.js, OK? Different versions here for Hyperledger 1.4 and 2.2, OK? But it is really good, so you have plenty of code samples here as well and how to interact and so on. Um, and the, uh, there's a kind of book here explaining all the details about the transactions. This is the one for Golang, so this is GoDoc again. OK, so you can check the information about the different interfaces. For example, all the documentation is here. Uh, this is the Fabric Client SDK for Go. Uh, I can say that given that Hyperledger and all the underlying components and technologies, including Docker and so on, they are implemented in Go normally. In Hyperledger, uh, the latest features, they are implemented as part of this Go SDK first. Then they move to the other SDKs. Um, OK. Well, I think uh, that's pretty much what I have today. Um, again, uh, we prepared uh, this landing page here with resources, so you can get more information about the Kubernetes services uh, available on our marketplace, the template, how to use uh, that with Hyperledger Fabric beyond my blog post. Um, yes, but that's it, Hugo. Uh, that's what I have for today. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Great, Juarez, thank you. And all, as always, a great session. Uh, we don't have any uh, questions on the channel, but uh, I just invite everyone if you have any question, you can drop in the chats or uh, even unmute and ask the question. In the meantime, Juarez, can you go back to the to the slide, please? Yes. So we can give you instructions on how people can access those materials. 
Okay, key takeaways, Azure is the best cloud for blockchain. Again, you know, we have all the choices, all the protocols here that you can use. Uh, make sure that you have a look at the deploy your first Hyperledger Fabric components um, with AKS, my blog post on Medium. Uh, the link to this uh, template on Marketplace is here, as well as a, links, uh, a, a link to all the GitHub examples. And that's it. And Ugo, uh, I think it's your time now to talk about the European Cloud Conference, right? Yeah, yeah. So now I want to share with you uh, this virtual full day tutorial series provided by our collaborator European Cloud Conference. In these full day tutorials, uh, you will have experts delivering sessions and helping you improve your knowledge on the different Azure topics mentioned on in these slides, such as Azure migrations, Azure messaging, computes, and more. To save your spots, you just need to access their website listed on the bottom of this slide, so www.europeancloudconference.com, and you should be able to see the details of these tutorials and sign up. Also, I think if you want to just load the um, slides of Microsoft sites, please, what is? Yeah, so if you want to access the materials that Juarez just showed, uh, please just scan the, this QR code that you can see in this slide or even use the ak.ms link and you just need to fill in a quick and short form and then you will have access to these materials provided by Microsoft. And also I want to let you know that I dropped um, the links for the next sessions. So next week on Monday, 31st, we'll have the next uh, section, session uh, in this series of blockchain. Uh, so Juarez will talk about Corda and how to use Corda on Azure blockchain. And also this Friday, we'll have the IoT series. So Victor will explain you how to create your first Azure IoT Central app. And I think that's it. So we are good to finalize, I think so, to close Juarez. Perfect. Thanks a lot again, Hugo. It was an ab absolute pleasure for me to present here today. Thanks. Thank you, Juarez, and thank you, everyone, to join us. And uh, keep tuned, because uh, Cloud Dungeon 1 will come back with uh, more sessions this week and next week. And thank you, thank you once again, and have a nice day. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you.